Ms. Beck. Steve, if you would like to have a chat with our group, please. Hi, uh, thanks, Stella. Uh, thanks for uh, asking me to give this talk as well. Uh, it's a slightly weird situation. Hugh is actually sat downstairs from me at the moment because uh, he's my partner and we're kind of in the same house together. <laughs> so <laughs> um, hopefully you won't hear any, him interrupting from downstairs. But boy, he's on mute now, so that's fine. Okay, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so is that working? Yeah, that's okay. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm Stephen Roberts. Um, I'm a quaternary geologist at the British Antarctic Survey. Hang on a second. Yeah, there we go. Um, and I've been working at Bass for about 16 years, since about 2004, that will be. Um, previously, I was at Bristol University, then London, then Edinburgh. Um, I did a postdoc and then uh, joined Bass. I've also done some lecturing, kind of associate lecturing and lecturing work at the Open University. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and also up at Manchester University in the last couple of years. Sorry, my voice is. <coughs> um, <laughs> that's not coronavirus. Um, Okay, so I work in the Paleo Environments, Ice Sheets and Climate Change Group at BASS, uh, shortened to PIC, and we look at quite a few uh, globally important to topics such as ice sheets, climate change, um, we look at ice shelf and ice sheet retreats, and we've also looked at sea level change and, um, and are currently looking at um, changes in temperature and wind around the Southern Ocean. Um, I work on various different Projects, most, some, are, some or most are NERC or EU funded. I supervise PhD or an MSc students on a regular basis and I'm part of the BAS uh, Equality uh, Diversity Group, as well as being uh, a member, a kind of committee member, I guess, of the, of the Pride in Polar Research um, Group, which BAS, uh, which Hugh introduced to you when you came to BAS. Right, so this talk is about um, living and working in Antarctica. Um, or in and around Antarctica actually and um, I'm not going to talk so much about the science but if you have any questions about the science please please either ask me afterwards or just uh, ask the questions in the in the chat so since since I joined Bass I've been to quite a few places in and around Antarctica uh, we've done a lot of work in Chile to start with which isn't really in Antarctica but um, and then we've also worked in South Georgia along the South Shetland Islands uh, which are can you see that can you see my arrow? Yeah. Okay, so we've worked along the South Shetland Islands um, and then down in Alexander Island, um, around in East Antarctica, over in the Sauron Day Mountains. Over at, I haven't actually been to Sierra, but we've worked with a group, the Japanese and the Indian group that have worked over there. Uh, and the same with the Lastman Hills over here. Uh, we've also been to some of the sub Antarctic islands um, that are surround Antarctica too. Um, so it's quite quite a lot of different projects, a lot of different groups, and a lot of it's very collaborative. Well, all of it's very collaborative. Um, I work on lake sediments, and I also do geomorpholo geomorphological mapping, um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about that as we go along. So in total, since I've been at Bass, I've actually been away in total for two and a half years, the 16 years that I've been at Bass, and that's bearing in mind that I only go down during the summer um, when it's when we can get there. I'm a scientist and we go for sort of usually about eight weeks at a time, um, but the longest I've been down is, is five months. So two and a half years on that basis is quite a long time. Uh, if you were working at Bass as a, um, and go down over the winter, you could quite quickly accumulate two and a half years uh, in the space of five or six years. But as a scientist, you might, you know, it would take you six, about 20 years to get up to two or three years worth of field work on the way that we work. So the field work examples I'm going to talk about uh, relate specifically to these three projects. And I'll go through them um, and I'll not talk about them as projects as much, but more about the places that we've been to and how we lived there and how we worked there when we were there. Um, I've had some interesting experiences. Um, I've played football on South Georgia, which is interesting, uh, against the Royal Navy. Um, I've cut up rocks in East Antarctica. I've caused several lakes in different islands around the Antarctic. Um, and we've been to Lyme Regis every year for the last 10 years to present all of our findings to 
um, you know, 10,000 people each day who come to the fossil festival. So it's a really varied uh, lifestyle and a very varied job. So you get to do a lot of exciting and interesting things that aren't just related to the work. So I'm going to give you a little bit, a taste of what it's like um, kind of work-wise and non-work-wise. Okay, so the first location we're going to go to today is the South Shetland Islands. And I spent quite a lot of time here. Um, we've worked on a place called Fieldes Peninsula, which is one of the ice-free areas on King George Island, um, very close to a big volcano called Deception Island. So you might have heard of that. Um, we're reconstructing climate and relative sea level change um, using lake and peak records, well, mostly lake records from, King, uh, from Fieldes Peninsula. Um, to get there, usually, I'm not, I don't know how, if this, this might be quite jerky um, coming across in Zoom, but there's a time lapse video of us going through the ice on the bottom left and some drone shots actually of Protector, but we went in on Endurance, um, which is another ship that we used to uh, have helicopters with. So in the early days, we would helicopter in all of our field kit uh, by sling loading about one and a half tons of Lake Corrin equipment from endurance onto the land. And we'd have to get dressed up in these immersion suits, um, which are kind of okay for myself and uh, Dominic Hodgson, who, uh, who is the science leader at Bass. Um, but for Emma, they were always a little bit too big. Um, and you'll see why in a second. Because Emma's kind of, now she's working in uh, Newcastle. And uh, we, this is the area that we went into. Um, this is uh, Ardley, this is Ardley Island. We were actually staying on King George Island. Uh, and this is our tent arrangement down here. So over here is the Chinese base. And we would go across and we would call these lakes. Uh, this one is called Yanu Lake. Ardley Lake is over here. Uh, and there's a couple more lakes around here as well. So we called a lot of these lakes, took sediment cores from these lakes. This was actually our home for about five months. Uh, myself, Emma and Bruce uh, lived in three or four tents um, and uh, we, we, we basically set up camp on the shores of the lake that we were working on the most. Um, if you look in, inside, the, the tents that we use are, are kind of old style tents uh, that have been used in Antarctica for nearly a hundred years. Uh, there's quite a lot of room inside. This is actually a three-man tent. Um, and we were only sleeping two people in there at a time. So Emma had our own tent, Bruce and I stayed in this tent. And inside, this is the setup that we would use. So we'd have a couple of food boxes and then we would cook our food on what's called a primer stove, a primer stove in between uh, the two sleeping beds, which is a, one is over here and I'm sat on the other one here. Uh, this is a tinny lamp that we use to keep for warmth, but in the South Shetlands, it's incredibly warm in the summer, as you can see. This was actually Christmas day. Um, and yeah, that was a lovely day. So we did a lot of washing and had a, quite a nice Christmas day then. Um, we also got a lot of help from the Chinese um, who, who have a base at Great Wall. It's called the Great Wall Base on Fjordes Peninsula. Uh, this gives you a flavor of what it's like to be there. Very early season down here. It's incredibly, incredibly stormy. Um, and then like throughout the season, the snow melts away and it becomes a bit more like, like the conditions that we saw in the previous photo. It's very comfortable inside. Um, we made some, these are, these are some of the friends that we made during the season that we were there. Uh, we had Chinese food for breakfast, lunch and dinner, and it was amazing. Um, they were some, made some really good friends and had a really good time. Um, most of the time we weren't working. Um, while we stayed there for a month, we played a lot of uh, table tennis. We sang a lot of karaoke. Well, some of us sang. Emma sang quite a lot, and so did Peter, who was another one of the people that we were working with. Um, the food, like I said, the food was amazing and they were really friendly. Um, then we went back in 2011 with Emma Pearson from Newcastle University, uh, kind of extending the work that we were doing in 2006. And while we were stuck on fielders trying to get across to our field site, uh, we took part in something called the Antarctic Olympics. This is where all the, there are nine bases on uh, Fieldless Peninsula. And so, and so they, and so they, um, they all get together on a certain day and they, they take part in badminton, volleyball. And um, here I actually represented the UK at chess um, and I lost. So <laughs> to a, I think, I'm not sure how old she was, but she wasn't very old, but she was incredibly good at chess. Um, so that's my 
first and last time at the Olympics, I think. Um, we did some work as well. So this is our Lake Corin setup. Uh, this is the lake while it's still frozen. Uh, this is Emma again, and uh, she she's standing in front of the platform that we would we would take across the moat to get onto the, the more solid ice. Um, and I've got some pictures here which demonstrate how Emma and I have two very different methods of doing um, the lake coring. <clears throat> lake coring is quite uh, a repetitive process. We essentially stand there for two, three days at a time uh, doing this uh, and then pulling a core out and you can kind of hear us talking <laughs> all the way through as we, were, as we were just kind of trying to drill the core into the sediment at the bottom of the lake. So yeah, so there's a, there's a Steve method and an Emma method. I'm not sure which was more successful. Actually, I think Emma's was more successful than mine because I ended up with a backache, but there you go. <laughs> okay, and at the end of it, these are the sorts of records that we pull out from the bottom of the lakes. They're very, what are called very finely laminated uh, lake sediment records. And each, you can think of these kind of like tree rings. Uh, they record all the events that are happening on the island around that lake uh, through time. So this actual core represents about 2000 years down here. And then it's a record of all the events that have happened, uh, including some volcanic eruptions that we talked, I showed you Deception Island before, um, all the way through to something up here called the Little Ice Age, which is slightly colder. Uh, and the top of the coral has this moss on the top of it. So we collect these records and we look at these back in the lab in Cambridge and uh, we analyze them for various different things that live in them. Uh, and we measure the geochemistry as well. So that's a quick summary of what we're actually doing. We also so collected with Emma when I went in 2011, uh, we also, also collected some very fresh uh, penguin guano samples that were literally came out of the penguins um, bum. <laughs> and so in, uh, so the current pro project I'm working on at the moment uh, arises from something, something called the Antarctic Circumnavigation Expedition or ACE. And we've been around to various islands um, in, on, around Antarctica in the Southern Ocean in 2016 and 2017, I think it was. Um, and we visited all of these and collected lake and peak records from all of these islands. Uh, and as you can see from this diagram, uh, some of them go back about 12 or 15,000 years. This is a big international project um, that involves a lot of uh, different collaborators that we've worked with over the years. You get to go to some spectacular places. So this is uh, Isla, Isla Hermite, which is just down the bottom by Cape Horn. Um, then nobody lives here. It's incredibly windy, uh, has some spectacular scenery looking up towards Terra de Fuego. Uh, this is us, Corin, well it's not me because I'm taking a photo, but it's the rest of the group uh, uh, taking samples from one of the lakes uh, that we actually cored on the edge of on the, edge of the um, coastline of Isla Hermite. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, we're looking at, we're basically looking at how um, CO2, how CO2, how the Southern Ocean modulates the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're looking at how, we're trying to reconstruct how the wind uh, influences the amount of CO2 that gets into the atmosphere and how, um, how that changes through time. It's actually quite difficult to reconstruct wind um, because it's, it's just very difficult. It's not like temperature uh, that you can measure something very directly. You have to do it indirectly. And I'll just quickly go through that. So what, what we're trying to, the quite big question we're trying to answer is, are the changes in past wind intensity uh, sufficient to explain past variation in atmospheric CO2? Um, and how we're doing it is quite a, a kind of novel and new, unique way. We've been to all these different sub-Antarctic islands. Um, we've been dropped off by, that went backwards, uh, dropped off by helicopter. And then we would collect lake and peak records uh, from the west coast. And this is Bianca Perrin, who we work with, um, collect, collecting a core from Kogeland, which is around here. So we went around in a kind of clockwise direction to all these different places um, at various times from 2013 to 2017 onwards. Uh, this is Marion Island. Uh, this is the, the kind of record that we would pull out. We would log it, wrap it, bring it back to the lab for analysis. Okay, so we, we're tracking past changes in wind within the core westerlies belt, the southern hemisphere westerlies belt over the last 12,000 years. And we're using new biogeochemical proxies and data, we call them, from lake sediments. 
And this, is, this works by you transfer, sea spray gets into the lakes and onto the peat records, and it changes the ecology of the organisms that live in the lake to, be, to become more what are called salt tolerant. So you have a change in the species. So when it's windier, you get more sea spray and you get more of these salt tolerant species uh, living in the lake sediments. And we go back through time and reconstruct um, how the chemistry and how the biological uh, changes have occurred within those sediments. So that's, that's one project. The last project I'm going to talk about is um, I'm working on a, a project with Jo Johnson at Bass. Um, she's the PI on this and uh, we're reconstructing how ice, ice, thickness, have changed, ice thickness has changed um, over, again over the last sort of 12, 15,000 years in an area called the Western Amundsen Sea Embayment. Um, this, this picture sort of shows you the setup that we, we have out there. This is actually on the ice sheet uh, and this is one of the tents that we would put up and then we would move around mainly with skidoos. Actually this picture shows you it better. Um, it's not an easy place to get to. It's very rare. It's a very, uh, it's not being visited very often. Um, and as I said, we're, we're, cha we're measuring changes in ice thickness through time. And these help us improve sea level predictions um, uh, for, the future, for the future. So how do we get there? Bass has a number of different research stations. Um, this is actually one of the, the com most complicated places to get to. Uh, so in 20, in 20 uh, 2015, 2016, we started off at Robera. We flew down to uh, Fossil Bluff onto Sky Blue, did a couple of stops in between where we dug up some fuel because it took us about two days to get to the field site, which is down in this area. Um, we stay in an area called Mount Murphy. Um, these are the Bass Plains that take us there. Initially, you would come, uh, you, we came across from Punta Arenas on the Dash uh, 7. And, and then we would catch uh, the smaller twin otters to do this kind of jump uh, route down to the, the Pine Island and Thwaites Glacier area, which you may have heard of. There's a, a big project going on at the moment. So this is the view mostly of the ice sheet. It looks kind of like this when you're flying in the plane. Um, not much to see. And then when we arrived, it was more like this. It was very misty. Um, so we'd be up in the mountains, uh, walking around each day, we'd skidoo to certain areas, and we'd be collecting rocks to do something called cosmogenic isotope, isotope dating. Um, here we are, we climbed up to the top of what's called Turtle Rock. Uh, there are four of us here, there's two field assistants or field um, uh, who help us survive in Antarctica. So we have one each, um, and these are the two field assistants. This is Al, and this is uh, Cheese, who's actually called Ian, but anyway. Um, and um, so we would, we would go up to each of these rocks in turn and collect geological samples from different heights. And then we work out how long they've been exposed at those different heights. So we'd be looking at rocks going down in staircases, which tell us how thick the ice sheet used to be. And to do that, we have to go to various different outcrops. Um, so Joe went across to this outcrop over here called Doral Rock. Uh, we, we took a lot of samples from the edge of this outcrop, which is called Turtle Rock. And as you can see, it's quite windy. There's an awful lot of snow. Um, this is the actual ice. This is actually, actually, actually ice where the ice sits today. So this is the glacier coming down here, coming around this area here, and a lot of buildup uh, of snow in that area as well. Um, it's a spectacular place to be. Um, we, I can't remember how many samples we collected. Uh, several several tons of some, well nearly a ton of samples I think it was to fly back with so there's an awful lot of sam rock samples from there okay and we were also setting up uh, a GPS station which essentially uh, which essentially measures how fast this area is being uplifted as you take the ice off the land lifts lifts up much much faster and you can measure that by setting up a fixed GPS's on the outcrops as well so this is Ian cheese um, setting it up here. So he's wearing a lot of the gear that we wear every day, uh, crampons, ice axes and safety gear and very often we would be tied together with the field assistant just in case we fell down a crevasse. Uh, and these are the areas that we went to in the end. This is the ice thickness on the present day and then so we've done some work now. We've reconstructed the ice thickness about 9,000 years ago and it was about this, this thick about 800 meters uh, at elevation. 
while we were there, we also mapped out, I used the drone, it's going backwards now. Uh, I used the drone to map out uh, some of the areas around Turtle Rock. Um, we also climbed up to this area down here called K Peak and Iceberg Rock to, to collect some samples. So um, that's pretty exciting. You know, you get to see some spectacular scenery um, and also we collected an awful lot of samples, like I said, in the space of about four weeks. Um, and all of this is contributing towards a, a big project called the Thwaites Glacier Project, which you might have heard of, which has been going on for like uh, at the moment and this season. And uh, this, this poster kind of summarizes uh, what we were doing out there. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish. There's a, hopefully this will play. This is some of the drone imagery and I'll sort of talk over it because it gives you an idea of how we set up and how we live. Um, so the tents are, the tents are set up in a row and they're spaced out quite far apart just in case there's a fire in one of the tents. This is our toilet tent. So we'd live in these tents and then go to the toilet over here. Um, and yeah, and again, so each night we would come back, we'd skidoo back to the, the campsite. Uh, we cover the skidoos up because we don't want them to get damaged during the day. And So yeah, so we'd be, we'd be, each day we'd be go out, you can see our tracks each day, we would go out up to here, we'd park up here, we'd climb up to these ro rocks up, uh, these rocks up up here on Turtle Rock. Um, and that's, that's a fairly, that's a fairly steep climb. So, I mean, some, sometimes um, there was a lot of physical exertion in that. I'll just let this run through. This is kind of the end of my talk. You can see myself and Al down here. Um, we're, flying, mapping out this area to map out what's, what's called the drift, the glacial drift in this area over here. Um, we also collected a lot of samples from up, up on the top of Turtle Rock here. So you can see what I mean about actually that was quite a tricky climb to get up there. Um, the area itself is quite heavily crevassed. So I mentioned before, I don't know how this is playing, it's probably quite jerky. Okay. Um, and so we have to be roped together. So here you can see Joe and Ian kind of roped up together to go across that area. So this is inside one of the crevasses because it's an incredibly, obviously an incredibly dangerous environment if you fall down a crevasse. Um, so we spend a lot of time before we go out into the field uh, having training at Bass and also training on site uh, with our field assistant. Uh, so we get used, to, get used to them, how they work, and then you build up a good kind of working relationship with one specific person who who is really responsible and you're also responsible for saving their life and he's responsible or she's responsible for saving your life if um, anything goes wrong. So you work as a team. Um, if you fell down a crevasse, uh, we, we would have situations where we'd be able to deal with that. Luckily, we didn't do that. Um, yeah, so here we are again. This is us actually collecting the samples on K Peak. This is Joe and Ian and myself and Al at the top. So safety is really important. We go around together, we, we look after each other. Um, and then in the evening, this is actually about, oh, I can't remember, it's about one or two in the morning, I think, uh, to give you an idea. So you have 24 hours of daylight and sometimes at one or two in the morning, it's actually brighter and sunnier and nicer to work in um, than at the start of the day, just because of the catabatic winds um, that are quite strong. So that's that. And it will just keep looping, I think. So I just, yeah, and uh, yeah, so here's some information about Pride and Polar research. I mean, he's, he's probably shown you this already. Um, but yeah, there's just some contact details if you want some more information about that. Um, and I think that's kind of it, really. <laughs> so I'll hand back to Donna. Thank you, Steve. That's fantastic. Um, I will stop the recording. Um,